to go outside much. This meeting is being recorded. The other day, my son told me, you know, you're on mute. The quiet, your class is on YouTube being recorded. I said, yes, we do. You, Steve tells us every time. So we watch our- <laughs> Watch what you say. Recorded. Watch your, watch your hand motions. Okay. Well, I've got to get my prayer. Uh, Minya, Minya emailed me earlier saying that she has a doctor's appointment uh -huh. this morning, so she will not be joining us. Okay. Right. Rabbi, are you ready? I'm, I'm ready. ready. Is right. everyone else ready? Yep. I think so. Okay. Um, couple of housekeeping things first before we start. Let's be respectful of others. Raise your hand so that we can acknowledge you before you uh, speak. And um, again, you know, let's keep on topic. I know that's challenging, but <laughs> let, us, let us try that. And uh, let's begin then with the blessing. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam, asher kedishanu mitzvotav, v'tzivanu l'azot divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the world, who has sanctified us with your commandments and commanded us to engage in the words of Torah. Amen. Okay, Rabbi, she's all yours. Good morning, Steve, and good morning, everyone. How are you good doing morning. today? Good morning. We're doing great. Thank you. Um, we are Parshat Naso, which is the second Parsha in the book of um, Numbers or Bamidbar. Uh, Bernie, I don't think you were here last week. Um, and um, apparently, Bernie, who lives in the mountains with the snow and plenty of water, just can't identify with the whole concept of being in the desert. <laughs> and, um, but the rest of us, or most of us, uh, can do so. <clears throat> I guess Shirley also has some difficulty because she's used to living in the swamps of Alabama with all the crocodiles. I remember when I was there, there was a crocodile crossed one of the main streets downtown oh, and stopped my. traffic for hours. And they tried to negotiate with him and mm -hmm. finally they had to bring in like a fortlift to remove him. So we don't have that and neither did the Israelites. They were in the desert with no, no very little um, greenery and probably no crocodiles. So being in the desert for 40 years is a very traumatic thing. And these are already slaves who've been already traumatized. And so we have trauma on trauma on trauma. So the Parsha this week is more trauma. And that is on page 18, um, the Perak Olive, the case of suspected adultery. Can we move from suspicion to trust? So this is a great topic because it involves sex, and everyone likes to talk about sex. That's all we can do at this point, just talk about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Don't touch that one, Rabbi. <laughs> Don't touch that one. Okay, well. Remember, you, this Pam. will be recorded. <laughs> Pam is my political advisor, and Evelyn, I've been advised not to respond in any way to that comment. <laughs> <laughs> but someone else can respond if they so choose. Um, but um, um, so, um, but but it's not it's not primarily about sex in a purian sense, but rather in a sense of betrayal of trust. Uh, and so you could expand this to not only sexual issues, but any sort of betrayal of, of trust in a marriage relationship. For example, where one spouse is gambling and empties hundreds of thousands of dollars out of the bank account of the, the joint family bank account or the a kid's uh, college fund to gamble, thinking, of course, I'm going to win and I'll replace the money and, and you know, have millions of more dollars on top of that. 
and uh, it usually doesn't work out that way. And even if it worked out that way, there's still a betrayal of trust, correct? Like you took the family's entire savings and you risked it. All right, you won, but shouldn't I have been part of that decision, you know, whether to, to make that risk? And I guess, I guess if your spouse comes back and says, honey, I, I, I risked all of our money that we saved over the last 55 years and I increased it 25 fold, you, your first response would be, wow, we won $400 million or whatever. But it's still a betrayal of trust. And there's hundreds of other such examples. I mean, some of them are more innocuous. I mean, there was a, a funeral I did not so long ago, and they told the funny story that the husband, um, they were driving with a, a brand new car to Las Vegas for vacation. And um, the wife had not been in favor of buying this car, the, this extravagant car. And somehow at the uh, gas station, um, the, the, um, the father put diesel fuel in the engine. Now the diesel fuel pump will not fit in the in the engine, so he must have struggled with it and not, you know, being tired and hot from the desert drive, must have taken a funnel and used the funnel, <laughs> you know. So you know it should have occurred to him that you know if you have to funnel it, then there's a reason that the thing won't fit in your car. Anyway, they then tried to drive off in the car would not drive on diesel and they had to eventually they got a mechanic from next door who said that um that he could he pull out all the diesel and then clean the engine and they could pick the car up on the way home and it costs like quite a bit of money to do that obviously and they had to rent a car and the husband concealed all of this from his wife and the, he, he swore the kids to secrecy Mm -hmm. And nobody ever knew until his funeral when the kids spilled the whole story. And it was funny. I mean, so some things are not betrayal of trust. I mean, do you really, does your, does your wife really want to know about that? No, better to just, you know, cover it up. So there's things that are betrayals of trust that are really serious. There's things that are betrayals of trust that are rather minor. And there's things where you don't, you lie or you conceal, where it's probably for the better. But how do you distinguish between this? Well, adultery seems to be a pretty clear case where um, it's in the most extreme category. Um, so that's my opening uh, comment. Um, as Steve said, I guess what we're trying to do is get the comments more pointed. So we want comments on specific issues rather than just people talking in general so that's that's my comments if anyone like to make a specific general point this is your this is your opportunity go ahead don't all speak at once we've got exactly 12 people here today so yeah. <laughs> it, it fills the screen very nicely. So okay, uh, all right. Um, so okay. I'm Marsh. So this this goes to the subject of um, reputation, because when someone is accused of something, and right or wrong, even when they were acquitted or uh, cleared of any suspicion of the, if they're innocent. It's, right. that it's still hanging over them, you know? One has to be very careful about what one yeah. says about someone else. It's your reputation is ruined. If, um, if, if I would be accused of stealing money from the temple, you know, I could, I could swear up and down that I didn't steal any money. I could say I don't have access to any money. Right. But if the word spreads around, the rabbi's accused of it, Right. But he's probably not guilty, but it's still, you never really, um, you, you know, he's the guy that was accused of stealing money from his own temple. Right. So, oh, he wasn't found guilty, but, but yeah, just the accusation, 
it, it, it stigmatizes. So yes, and uh, and with sexual things, it's even worse. Okay, I th I thought sex would be a big selling point today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, idolatry is just the. In biblical times, men were allowed to have a number of wives. Yes. You said idolatry. You mean adultery? Adultery. adultery. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. Adultery. We knew what you meant. Yes. Um, so that that's not adultery, the multiple wives, just the multiple True. The activities of the woman, correct? Um, yes. But if the, the, the man is having sex with a married woman, then it's adultery for the man. Okay. Um, um, and yes, yes. Were so, they, yes, Marcia. Are there any um, ramifications for that? Yeah, the man could be executed as well. Right. Adultery is adultery, but uh, but yes, women were uh, had to have only one husband. Um, men, men theoretically could have up to four, but even the Bible, you don't see, you know, Abraham's family was very wealthy relative to the people around. <clears throat> well, Abraham had a wife and then he had a con at least one concubine. Right. Um, um, Jacob had two wives and two concubines, but he didn't really want the second wife. So, um, you know, there were, um, you know, there was more flexibility there is correct. Uh, Nan. Yeah, one thing that that I sort of puzzles me in in a lot of the biblical things we read about, while Judaism is a matriarchal religion where the mother is the one who um, gives the Jewish line, you know, going down. And I guess it's because she actually births the child. But she seems, it's my opinion, that she, women get unfairly treated in the Bible. They're subject to more punishment um, for all kinds of things. And this sort of bothers me. It's almost like, well, you know, we... You're you're gonna get the brunt of most stuff, and I, I just think that this is unfair, or maybe it has to do because this is when the Bible was written, and that was the general thought. I mean, um, uh, let me uh, let me ask about Nan's assumptions here. Her, did you hear her opening statement? Was Judaism is a matriarchal yeah religion okay do you agree how many, raise your hands raise your hands if you agree with nan that judaism is a matriarchal religion raise your hands no. raise your hands if you think judaism is a patriarchal religion yes definitely and so that's five patriarchal and how many was matriarchal three or four and then who doesn't want to take a position <laughs> <laughs> people that don't want to take a position don't want to even raise their hands that they're not taking a position they're trying <laughs> to keep a very low profile but um i would argue with nan i don't like arguing with nan because <laughs> she's she's becoming one of the matriarchs of our temple now you know no i don't know well, uh, Nan has done more to, to try to soothe over ruffled feathers and try to keep the temple on a even kill than almost anyone else in the last six months or a year. So um, uh, Nan has emerged as a really, really, really key figure in our leadership in a positive way. So uh, it's been uh, so I don't want to argue with her because she's like the big boss. But. <laughs> Um, but I'm but, open to a good debate, so okay, let's go. Good. <laughs> yeah. But I would say that Judaism is very much a what what biblical religion is very much a patriarchal religion. What she's talking about is the Jewish identity determined by the mother was only a policy passed by the rabbis in the first two centuries CE, meaning 2,000 years ago. Judaism goes back at least 3,300 years. And therefore, or maybe more, and um, 
Um, and so therefore I see it certainly early Judaism up to the rabbinic period as very patriarchal. Um, but uh, um, I saw some hands. Was that Riva? Riva and then Steve. Yeah, just a couple of quick comments. One is I would differentiate between matrilineal and patriarchal. You know, it's matrilineal in terms of inher in inheriting being Jewish. And one reason for that would be that you don't always know who the father is, but you do know who the mother is for sure. Um, this, the second point is, so I would say that the one, it Judaism over time has tended to be certainly much more patri patriarchal. Men, are, men are, have much more power than women in many, many ways. But we also see that evolving throughout our studies, that it's, cha it's changed over time. And in, certainly in modern times, we see differences in the different Jewish uh, denominations or whatever they're called, you know, between the Orthodox and the most Reformed. Um, there's differences in how the genders are, are viewed and treated and how much power they have. One specific thing I noted there, and that was that, uh, that there's emphasis in, in this chapter or this parak on uh, modesty and that women were required to be very modest. And I know to this day in Orthodox communities, there's very strict standards about what modesty consists of. It includes for married women having their hair covered. Um, you, you should be wearing clothes that, that um, end uh, below the <laughs> elbow. Your collarbones are supposed to be covered and your toes shouldn't be hanging out there <laughs> on a hot day. So I think, you know, and if the woman is not sufficiently modest by some standards, then she's responsible for any misbehavior that occurs. Mm. Okay, I'll respond to some of that later, but Steve. Okay, um, in the Bible, it, it, even though women were considered second class uh, compared to the men, they were very influential in, in the decisions that the men made. Uh, you know, I mean, look, look at Sarah and, and the fact that, you know, she banished, you know, uh, the Kantaban and Ishmael. Uh, I mean, and then there are other instances similar to that. So they were more influential uh, with the man, men uh, in, in those periods. Um. Okay, um, Marsha, and then I'll try to respond a little bit to Riva. Well, and I'm responding to Steve. You said they're influential in the decisions the men made. So it was the <laughs> men who made the decisions. But that was at oh. the time. So the, that, that's what how things were then. Absolutely. Uh, not. Yes, absolutely. Yes, they, they had influence, but they were not the bottom line. The bottom line were always the men. Yeah, but they... <laughs> There were consequences for the men, for the men <laughs> in case they weren't getting that. No, no, I am sure. Back. Yes. <laughs> um, so Riva differentiates be, between matriarchal and matrilineal. So yeah. matriarchal is women run things. Matrilineal is women determine descent, you know, through their birth. Um, but, but and she says Judaism became more uh, more focused or entirely focused on the matriarchal descent, matrilineal descent, but didn't necessarily become more matriarchal. So, do you agree with that, Ken? If the rabbis switched policies entirely and said a Jewish child is determined by the mother, not the father, re reversing a policy going back at least a thousand years before that. Right. King Solomon, for example, had hundreds of wives who came from all over the world. And all of those children were regarded as Jewish because they were his kids. Right. Uh, presumably, you know, if not, then there would be some big problems. So they didn't have DNA testing. Um, I, I'm opening my own DNA testing lab right now. <laughs> oh, who's so. doing your DNA? <laughs> okay. Yes, and so I'm not sure which one's going to get the treatment first, but um, they are both very resistant. They don't want their DNA in the criminal files, but they didn't have DNA back then. But don't you think that 
Uh, if, if you're suddenly switching Jewish uh, identity markers from men to women, doesn't that indicate, does or does that not indicate that power is moving um, in that direction as well? I mean, that's a, that's a neutral question. I'm not necessarily arguing for that, but let's see. So Marsha shaking her head, no, Marsha, and then maybe Reva, and then maybe Evelyn. Well, so wasn't that, didn't that matrilineal um, uh, consideration, whatever, happen when the, they had, when the Romans invaded and there was all that rape going on and they had to keep the Jewish line going somehow? Um, well, that's, that's a story given, yeah. Yeah, so it wasn't because they wanted the women to be the, the, uh, indicator okay. of who was Jewish and who was not. It just, they, it was more of a practical situation. It had nothing to do with respect for women or of that, okay. that sort of consideration. All right, so much for that idea, Sai. <laughs> uh, can we, can we rightly assume that uh, all these rules and regulations are not God given, but rather rabbinical, rabbinically yes. given? Well, in this case, the matrilineal descent thing is totally human. It, you know, the even I think the Orthodox possibly agree to that. Yeah, that this is completely, you know, and, and this is a rabbinic concept that it's the law, the determination of how to make legal policy is with the rabbis, not with God. So um, the rabbis felt this was a good law to make. They made it. Yes, but how does that affect anything? Sai? Well, no, so there, I was just thinking that uh, that changes your whole relationship and your attitude about a lot of things since mm -hmm. the rabbis decided what the rule is rather than God-given. It's two different points of view. And the rabbis were pretty much all men. Uh, there was one right. woman, Bruria, Exactly. who was considered quite a scholar, but the they rabbi call, said... calling the shots. And the, the rabbi said that because she tried to become a, a, a you know, big scholar and a, like, but like a rabbi, she went crazy. You know, so they didn't, they didn't have a lot of encouragement for that kind of uh, uppityness. But in our temple today, would you say that it's dominated by men or women, or how does where's the power dynamics fall in our temple? Probably women. Ooh, Probably women. Man. She's a <laughs> she's a new haze of Donna. <laughs> There's substantially more women in the temple than men. The numbers are quite different. You think it's uh -huh. because of long right. longevity? Yes. Yeah, so a lot of the men have died. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's just the way it is, yeah. Steve, what do you think? Uh, oh, Evelyn? I was going to say, what is more typical in the average temple and synagogue where you have complete families, and there it seems to me that would be the men would be more predominant. We are unique in the sense that we are, quote, a retirement type of temple, and therefore... The men, unfortunately, do not last as long as the women do. And therefore, we are askewed in the sense that uh, we there are a predominant number of women and perhaps there are more women on the board. Uh, they have more say, but I think it's essentially because there are more women rather than men. And perhaps the men don't feel at this particular point in their lives that they want to become involved in the organization. Um, I think we are not a typical congregation from that standpoint. And therefore, I don't think you can use us as an example uh, of what is typical in a congregation. Per se. All right, hold up, Marsha. Just so surely you've seen our congregation, you visited once and you've seen from a distance. Would you say Alabama is more uh, dominated by men than we are here? No, I think it's the same as yours. Oh, really? Huh. Look at look at so, the class. Uh, Just look at this class. 
and count up the number of men and women who decide that they're going to, you know. Well, there's four four men and eight women. And you are the rabbi. Let's I not put the food you in there. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not the big biggest difference as as your temple has, but I think there are still more men than women. No, I mean, more, more women, women than men. Than I'm sorry, more women than men, but maybe not. I think you have more women um, proportionately than what we have. And the power dynamics, would you say, is uh, the same or different? Oh, I think it's about the same. Okay, so women dominate there as well, more or less. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> except, except for a couple of men who, who, who run the place. <laughs> <laughs> do, we have a couple of, do we have a couple of men who run the place? Not, not as much. Okay, so... Uh, I, I think Evelyn's point is well taken that, you know, there's a certain dynamic here that's partly result of our, you know, unique situations. Okay, who was next is Marsha and then Steve. Steve, do you want to say something? Not really. I mean, uh, comparing other congregations I'm familiar with and grew up with, uh, this is definitely a women-dominated congregation. Um, that's just my, my, my observation. And how does that affect policy? Does, do women have a different approach to policy? Mm, I wouldn't think so. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really make any substantive difference. It's just who's running things. Nan and then Marcia. Our, our board this year, though, is about, um, it, it's almost equal 50-50 in the number of men and the number of women on the board, um, we in this year we are uh, have a we have a, a female president, but next year we're going to have a, a a man in president. And I think this, you know, changes. It just depends who's willing, you know, to step up. But um, the the board uh, makeup this year we is intentional to try to keep it you know, a 50-50 dynamic so that we get equal participation and input. Um, but Nan, does it make a difference? You find the men behave differently, have a different orientation? Uh, it depends. Push I, I think it's, it's, per, it's personality. And I mean, there are some women that are very strong personality and can, you know, um, make their positions clear, but then there are men who, you know, just, um, you know, become a little more aggressive and um, it, it's it's similar to a workplace. You know, if uh, men in the workplace in, in top management can get away with doing things that a woman in the same position, she's gonna be a target and not be able to do. So, I mean, we're, we're trying to keep the peace and not have that happen, you know, but um, it's, uh, as far as the board this year, I believe out of the, the um, 14 that we have on the board, because we have two open trustee positions, they are, I believe it's, it's like seven and seven or pretty close to that, so. Mm -hmm. um. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, uh, Sai, Riva, Marsha. The point that I was trying to make is that when you, we want, when we read about all these rules and regulations, regardless of whether they're made by men and women, but have nothing to do with God, how important is this in the religion? I mean, is this have anything to do with the religion. To me, it has nothing to do with the religion. I mean, that's something aside. It has nothing to do with the religion because God has nothing to do with it. This is all man-made stuff. And if it's man-made stuff, to me, it's not part of a religion. Interesting. So, so I guess um, it depends what you call religion, right? So right. if you just want the theoretical stuff that comes from God, presumably, supposedly, then um, 
then you would limit it to uh, only the early stuff, really. Right. When they but, told, when we read about the Ten Commandments coming from God, that has in my mind substance as a relationship to God. But when we talk about this other thing, it's got nothing to do with God. It's not even part of a religion. Some some rules, some guys made up. That's all. Interest. This is one of the most interesting comments I've heard in a long time. Um, I, I guess, you know, my, um, my interest is in the whole development of Judaism, you know, rather than what, you know, presumably came from God. So I find the later stuff perhaps more interesting because we can trace it better that it's not from God, that it's from people and that people created it or extended it or adapted it under specific circumstances. So that for me is fascinating. But I guess you could argue, and I guess others have, that if you're interested in Judaism, the religion, the part that comes from God is the only part that's really important. Interesting point, Sai. Anyone want to respond to that? Marsh, um, Reva was first. Reva, do you want to respond to Sai? Or should I just hold your comment for a minute? Um, I think regarding Sai, I don't, I don't have very much to say. Um, but regarding our demographics right here, right now, we're now 10 women and four men. I think there's a difference in our temple and probably many uh, religious organizations between the balance in leadership and the balance between men and women. And we're saying now, as Nan has said, that there's probably it's equally divided for the most part in leadership and membership. I think there's a much greater um, number of women who are members of the temple compared to men. Um, I think that I think is um, less equal than what we're seeing perhaps on the board. So you have to look at both leadership and membership. They're separate. Okay. And so, then, yeah, let me just, uh, the, the idea of the feminization of American religion uh, goes back 40 years. So I, I have a book in Jamaica called The Feminization of American Religion. It was published a while ago. So the idea that religion in America, at least, has been more interesting to women than men goes back a long way. In fact, I remember when I was in Wisconsin uh, seeing some of the, um, the, the, the notes from like the late 19th century and the rabbi wrote in there, the services that we have is over, you know, the, the people who come are mainly women. And uh, I mean, I, you know, um, um, the rabbi in Alabama going back a hundred years, uh, uh, Rabbi Alfred Moses started what he called Jewish science to compete with Christian science because some of the women in his congregation were getting interested in Christian science. And he felt if he lost these women, he lost the congregation. So now why is religion more interesting to women than, or more compelling to women than men? And that, that's a separate question. Um, uh, so back to Marsha and Evelyn, we have two arguments going here that are different. Sai's argument is we want to study religion from God, not how it develops sociologically by people later. Re Reva's point and other people's point was that, um, you know, about male versus female dominance in religion. So two separate points. Don't introduce a third, <laughs> but you can address, just tell us if you're going to talk about Sai's point or Reva's point. Marsha and then Evelyn. I'll try a little of Sai, okay? Because, and I don't want to get into it totally because my uh, the Torah portion that I'm going to be leading in a few weeks has got to do with someone who says, we don't need all these laws in religion. We only need God and we're holy and as anybody else. And we don't need leaders. We just mm -hmm. have to just follow God and that's it. 
And that's basically what Ty is saying. We don't need all the man-made rules that become part of the Judaic tradition, right? Right. Right, Ty? So you don't really need uh, the holidays. You don't really need the rules. You don't need the regulation. So that's got, that's, it's a very testy point there, you know. And, who, and who's going to keep this religion together if we don't have some sort of organization of uh, ideas that, that people can follow? You know, if you just go willy nilly and saying, I'm Jewish or Jewish, if you will, you know, like some people are saying, of the mind of, I mean, then that isn't really a religion, it's just an idea, you know, that's floating around. So, um, you have to be careful about that. You have to still have a framework, I believe, uh, to, to make it Judaism an actual religion that people can follow. Okay, Evelyn, and then we'll try to start our uh, weekly uh, readings. <laughs> well, well uh, I think women today are the ones that, uh, Jewish women are the ones that actually keep the religion going. Uh, they are the ones who insist on belonging to a congregation. I don't think the average man today is as involved because he's involved in earning his livelihood. But the women want to feel that they belong to a larger group. And that larger group is their religious group. And they feel a comfort in belonging to a synagogue or temple. And they want their children to be part of that also. They are the ones who drive the kids to the Hebrew school. Uh, yes, years ago, the husbands used to go on Sundays. That was their free day. And they would schmooze and have coffee and, and socialize with each other while the kids were in Hebrew school. But it is basically the mothers who keep the Jewish home and who take the kids and ensure that the Judaism is continued as such. And to me, I think when the woman in the marriage is not Jewish and does not have that same feel, very often, if the husband, first of all, has married someone who is non-Jewish and does not care about continuing the religion, it's indif he's indifferent to it. So when you stop and think, it is the mother of the family who happens to be Jewish who will see to it that there is that continuity and, co and continuing Jewish study and making sure that the je next generation of Jewish men and women are ensured in a sense. And so my feelings are that the women, in spite of the fact years ago, their role was less critical because men were the ones who were dominant within the synagogue Today in America, the social situation makes it such that it is critical that the Jewish women insist on the youngsters not only being bar mitzvahed, but that they continue uh, on with their education and participation. And frankly, I think our culture actually discourages this because we find that when they drop out of synagogues after their bar mitzvah, they're involved in high school sports, they're involved in outside activities. And then of course the parents are concerned about paying for college. So paying for continued membership in the synagogue becomes less critical. I think our society currently is not conducive to continuing and feeling that sense of affiliation with a temple and synagogue. It is no longer the social focus that it was in generations past. Mm -hmm. And you had a, a, I'm thinking of Charleston, Savannah, where they had a, a strong Jewish congregations as such. Being Jewish meant that you were unique in the community. And the only way you could feel a sense of security was to belong to this synagogue and have the synagogue being supportive of you and its and all of the members. Uh, that does not exist today. And so <laughs> I really still feel very strongly that it is the woman who today continues um, making sure that Judaism is, is a continuous process rather than, uh, rather than the men.
maybe I do the men an, uh, an injustice, but um, this is my own personal experience as such. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's start the, uh, let's get back to our main topic, sex. And uh, we can uh, turn to page 18. Peric Olive, the case of suspected adultery. Can we move from suspicion to trust? Um, welcome to Minya and to Donna. And um, we're up now to 14. Our record uh, set many months ago was 19. And, um, but we're not gonna get back to that right at the moment, but hopefully someday. So let us um, let us read. Who'd like to uh, who'd like to read? Okay, Pam Katz, who's joining our board effective July first. In addition to her stewardship of our Garden of Eden, and don't forget the book club and the book. Oh, yes. and, the, and the book club. Oh. Okay, okay. a pair. Paraf Aleph, The Case of Suspected Adultery, Can We Move from Suspicion to Trust? The book of Proverbs contains a number of valuable insights into human behavior about patience and jealousy. It teaches patience results in much understanding, impatience results in foolishness. A calm disposition assures physical health, but jealousy rots the bones. By drawing a parallel between impatience and jealousy, Jewish tradition provides a context in which to understand the case of a sota, a wife suspected by her husband. Did I pronounce that right, Rabbi? Yes, sota. Okay. What does the Torah tell us? Two situations are described. The first one is the case of a wife who has had sex <coughs> with another man and keeps the ma matter a secret from her husband. The husband suspects her, but he has no witness. His jealousy grows against her. What shall he do? Second situation is of a wife who has not had sexual relations with another man. Her husband, however, suspects her. Though he has no witness, he is wild with jealousy. How is she to be protected from foolishness of her husband? Within ancient society, such cases were handled through tests or ordeal. Tests. The, Babylon the Babylonian cone of Hama Hammurabi. Thank you states that a wife suspected by her husband of infidelity is to prove her innocence by throwing herself into a river. If she survives, she is innocent. If she drowns, she was guilty. Other cultures also record harsh measurements for suspected wives. They could be thrown out of the house by their husbands, divorced, publicly humiliated, beaten, or killed. Some societies use trials by fire or, as in the Torah, the drinking of a ritual mixture prepared by priests. Clearly, women suffered at the hands of jealous husbands, and their treatment was often cruel. There was, however, no similar trial for husbands who might be suspected, justly or unjustly, by their wives of infidelity. Such equal justice did not exist in ancient times. However, the Torah does offer a significant advancement in the protection of women. So do interpreters. Okay. Um, and we're going to see that Sota is a whole um, tractate in the Talmud. Um, and um, the, the gist of it is an attempt to try to limit the damage set down by the Torah. So if we go back to Sai's example, if we say that the Torah, where it says that the wife should be subject to a test to see whether she's guilty or not is from God, then the rabbis are man-made, man-made, literally man-made, are trying to limit the potential abuse of this accusation. You know, the husband may know may know that the wife is not guilty of adultery, but he's mad at her for other reasons, right? That's very common in all situations, right? If you don't like somebody for something, but you don't feel that that reason is acceptable, you don't, you know, you don't accuse them of the truth, which would not get support. You rather make up other things and you accuse them of other stuff, which you think if people believe you is more 
extreme or more convincing or more, more liable. So many of these men may have known that their wives were not guilty. Or the husband could be completely irrational, jealous kind of guy. And, you know, he's insane. He believes that she's having affairs with the postman. And it's ridiculous. The postman's just dropping off the mail. But you heard the, uh, the joke about the guy and they said he goes to a fortune teller and the fortune teller says, I've got very bad news. Your father's about to drop dead of a heart attack in five minutes. So he frantically calls his father and his father says, I'm fine. Everything's good. I'm at work. And then he gets on the second line. He gets a frantic call from his mother. She says, you won't believe what terrible thing just happened. The postman was delivering the mail and he dropped dead right on the front door. <laughs> so, so thank you for laughing. Um, but uh, yes, Minya. Some of the things that they did, it seems um, the witch, the Salem witch trials use the yeah. same kind of tests mm -hmm. to see whether women were innocent or guilty. Um, so they must have gone back to this code of Hammurabi to get ideas about what to do to women. Uh, I don't think they went to code of Hammurabi. I think they went to the Bible. You know, I think they used the, uh, the Jewish sources because the Christians, uh, 300 years ago, uh, we know about the code of Hammurabi. I forget when it was when it was found, but I don't think it was even found then. But what the Harvey Fields point is that the Code of Hammurabi was written around the time of the Torah, roughly, maybe a little before. And you could see the whole ancient Near East did this sort of stuff. You know, so it was somewhat similar. And the point is that maybe the Torah is a little bit more favorable to women and that Later, the rabbis try to make it less unfavorable. So there's an attempt to help the status of women, limited as it was. And so, um, you know, I mean, that, that used to be a talking point in favor of Judaism. Today, the young people are not really too uh, patient with anything that's less than full total equality and to explain how these things developed in thousands of years ago, there's not a lot of interest in that. It's like, we don't even want to hear about anything that, that happened before 2022. Um, Evelyn, Eve, Eve, uh, sorry, Minya? Can I just finish? <clears throat> so you're saying that in the Torah, it actually says, throw the woman in the water, see if she drowns. If she drowns, then she was guilty. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I no, I, I'm not I sure. I'm not that. sure. But I don't think it came from the Code of Hammurabi because I don't think they knew about it. But, you know, I don't know. That's a very good question. Where exit? I would think that the people were influenced primarily by Jewish and then Christian texts. But I'm not sure. But I don't think it was Code of Hammurabi. But that you're going to have to check that up for us, Minya. Maybe you can quietly Google it while we're talking right now. Yeah. Um, Evelyn and then Bernie. Is there one court of law in Jerusalem that laid these laws down, or were there individual rabbis scattered throughout the country that gave their own legal opinions as such? Well, that's a great question, and it's one that I can't totally answer. I mean, in the in the biblical period, as you know, originally Moses was the judge. Eventually, as you, re you remember from a partial, we talked about that about three months ago. Um, Moses' father-in-law says, you have to spend more time with your family on weekends. And you're working too hard. And, you know, you're both the CEO of the Israelites Incorporated and you're running all the legal system. You've got to hire judges. And so Moses then hires a bunch of judges. 
So, but th then once you get the second temple period going forward several hundred years, <clears throat> or, or when you go forward three or 400 years, you get the kings of Israel. So they are running things and they have their judges. Once you go to second temple period, there's still sort of kings, but they're very weak. And um, you have the Sanhedrin, which is a court of 70 or 70 or 72 in Jerusalem that operate kind of in conjunction with the temple. Once the temple's destroyed and there's no more Sanhedrin, then that's the beginning of the rabbinic period. And then any, you'd have rabbinic courts of three, you know, but baked in. And so theoretically from that point on, you could have a court anywhere you wanted to where you could find three, three, you know, men deemed wise enough in law, in Jewish law to make these rulings. So it depends on the period. It's hard to know whether what's written is what was done. You know, just because, just because it says in the Torah or in the Talmud, something was the practice doesn't mean that's what people did, right? So it's all hard to evaluate. But I would say in the rabbinic period, three rabbis could form a Beit Din and they could they could judge the case. Does that answer your question a little yes. bit? Yep. Okay, Marsha. And so from what you were just saying, it's never women who judge men and women. It's always men who judge men and women. In the well, you're not suggesting... In the, in the Judaic... You're, uh, you're, you're not suggesting that a woman could serve on a Beit Din, are you? <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> okay, so... Well, and this is a fight going on in Israel today with the, within the Orthodox community that there are more liberal elements in the Orthodox community that have trained women to be um, like legal uh, counselors. Right. And they have rabbinic courts, which are paid for pretty much entirely by the government out of taxes. And it's entirely and, Orthodox. And, and um, Orthodox? Hundreds of millions of dollars, dollars a year go to the rabbinic courts there. And uh, there is no civil marriage or divorce, for example. All of mar marriages and divorce among Jews have to go through the orthodox rabbinic courts, which are paid for the salaries, the buildings, everything paid for by the Israeli tax dollars. And so they're no trying to... They're, well, they're trying, they're training women to be um, advocates, you know, basically lawyers in the rabbinic court system. So they do have some women, you know, the ultra orthodox are trying to fight it. Ah. But, but there is, that be, I don't know that much about it, but there is an attempt to push women into the orthodox legal um, setting. I think they need to do away with the entire setting. You know, and, you know, but uh, Bernie. You're not. You have to unmute Bernie. Unmute Bernie. Unmute. Unmute Bernie. Um, no, there we go. There we go. There we go. Um, the, uh, the business of throwing the woman in the river, according to Fields on the page we just read, was um, from the Code of Hammurabi. And further on in the, in the text, he mentions that uh, the, the, the Jewish way was to make them drink some bitter water. It didn't, didn't describe uh, what all that meant. But that was supposedly the test of purity. Right. Yes. Right. And this was this was mixed. It was made by the Kohanim, of which I'm a Kohen. So if you want some of the bitter water, I, I sell it. You know, you can pick it up or I can send it to you in the mail. Sorry, I don't have anybody to give it to. <laughs> now okay. I know where we got the expression, God forbid. <laughs> I'm trying to develop a profitable side gig, but nothing seems to work. Mom, Minya. This is what I found. 
The Code of Hammurabi is a Babylonian legal text composed from 1755 to 1750 BC. What does it say about adultery? The code also listed different punishments for men and women with regard to marital infidelity. Men were allowed to have extramarital relationships with maidservants and slaves, but philandering women were to be bound and tossed into the Euphrates along with their lovers. So that means the, witch, the Salem witches couldn't have used it because that was before 1780. No, 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 no. BC. When, where, and Minya, does it say when it was rediscovered? In 1901. Right. Oh, okay. So, All right. So, my so the, the people my in Salem didn't know about it because it hadn't been rediscovered yet. So it was so, then, so then now Google, what did the Salem witch trials use as the basis for their for their uh, policies, you know, what was this, the sources that they, where did they get the, their uh, procedures from? You have to unmute. You're, you're muted. Unmute, Minya. Okay, she's going to look that up. And okay. so, um, okay, Pam, we're back to you. We can have you read a little bit more. Okay, um, where are we? Um, in Sorta, uh, the entire section of the Talmud dealing with the subject of suspected adulteress, rabbinical authorities carefully prescribe a process that a je jealous husband must follow. If he suspects his wife of having an affair with a specific man, the husband must warn her in the presence of two witnesses about meeting secretly with him. Then, only if he has two witnesses who testify that she secretly spent time enough to have sexual relations with the man, can her husband request that she be forced by the court to drink the water of bitterness. The case may not be heard by a local court, but it must be taken to the Supreme Court or Sahadrin in... Sahadrin. Thank you. Hedrin. Only the Supreme Court has the power to order a wife to drink the water of bitterness. However, if the man has been unfaithful to the woman, either before or after their marriage, or she is disabled, he has no right to bring such charges against her. Oh, so um, what's the expression? What's good, good for the goose is good for the gander. So if he's been unfaithful in, uh, in marriage, they can't accuse him of adultery and punish him because there's it's not really adultery in a in a biblical sense, but it disqualifies him from uh, uh, accusing uh, his wife of adultery. So that's quite a so so there is a certain um, negative ramification to him if he is has been. Um, having sex with other people outside of marriage. Other people in this case means women. There was no recognition for same-sex relationships that I'm aware of. But it'd be interesting to see how, if the man, for example, was having an affair with another man, would that make any difference? Or if the woman was having a, a relationship with another woman, would that make a difference? So clearly, these laws were not what we would call, in today's terms, gay friendly. But it, it'd still be interesting to see. Um, so, so, um, so that Sanhedrin is the only one who can deal with it. So this goes back to the question that Evelyn asked. And so, um, and we're talking here now in the rabbinic period. But, but, but the early rabbinic period before the temple was destroyed, I don't think there was a Sanhedrin. In fact, I'm sure there was no Sanhedrin after the year 70. Yes, Pam. Were the Sanhedrin all men? Yes. Of course. <laughs> okay. I mean, everybody in any responsible position was a man in those days. I mean, you had to, one of the basic qualifications to be on the Sanhedrin, you had to be Jewish, you had to be a male. 
you had to be over age 13, you had to be a learned scholar in, in Jewish law. Most of the Jewish law issues were not things that Tsai would regard as religious concepts from God. So really what they're spending most of their time with is Jewish civil law. And uh, so Sai would say what they're spending their time on is not really the important stuff, religion from God, but that's what they studied. And that's, you know, they needed that if they're going to make rulings, not just on this, but there was tremendous amount of civil, civil law. So there, the, the, there's three tractates, Baba Metzia, Baba Kama, Baba Batra, and each one deals with different aspects of property law. So Baba Metzia opens in the very famous case, two men are holding a talit, and one grabs one corner of the talit and says, this talit is mine, and the other guy has the other end, and he says, the talit is mine. And so they come to the rabbis, they're both still holding the talit, and they said, we're having a fight, who owns this talit? And the rabbis have to figure it out. So that, you know, they have, they go back and forth. So one rabbi says, whoever's holding more of the talit gets it. And then, you know, they debate that, and they bring citations from the Bible to prove their yeah, this rabbi will say that it's based upon this uh, sentence in the Bible that says, whoever has the more portion is the, you know, whatever. And he says, this sentence in the Bible uh, is, is a precedent, is a, um, you know, indicates uh, my, my proof text for my position. And another rabbi said, no, it's not that, and brings a proof text why it's wrong. Then somebody else gives another idea, and it goes back and forth. So it's not just this issue here, but they felt this was more important than just a three-person bait in. You had to bring it to the Sanhedrin, which also means that once the Sanhedrin is abolished after the destruction of the Second Temple, there's no way to really, um, you know, deal with these uh, cases of suspected adultery. Minya, did you find anything yet about um, about what sources the Puritans used uh, in New England for the witch trials? Not yet. I will okay. check again. Okay. Riva and then Sai. Yeah, my understanding of um, the Beit Din is that in the Jewish community and now in, in modern times, the Orthodox Jewish com community a divorce would only be approved if the husband agrees to the divorce. Right. Um, as it's not the wife. And so at times a woman might want to be divorced from the husband, but she can't be divorced in, in, until he approves it. And sometimes, um, in some cases, and I know of some that have been published, where the woman really wants to divorce, the husband doesn't. And he says, okay, I'll divorce you, but you don't get any of our family shared resources. Um, so, so, yes. So, um, in the, the, the tractate of Gittin, it's a whole tractate um, talking about divorce. The process is the husband has a, 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 a star Gittin, a document of divorce prepared for him. This has to be done in a very precise way. So you have to have a scribe who really knows what they're doing. And the scribe makes a document saying, I, you know, uh, Joseph, um, uh, divorce my wife, my current wife, Rachel. And that puts into effect the ketubah, where she gets us in the ketubah, it says what, what, it, what she gets in the case of divorce. Um, so he, he has the scribe write this document. He either then delivers it to his wife or he hires someone to deliver it for him. She must accept the document. If she refuses to open the door because she doesn't want to get divorced, it's, the divorce is not finalized. If he won't write the document and have it delivered, they're not divorced. So in modern Israel, as I said, that all of marriage and divorce is still in the hands of the ultra-Orthodox. 
Um, what happens if a husband will not write a divorce? So the, the couple hate each other. They won't live together. They don't talk to each other. They hate each other. So under those circumstances, Judaism would say, all right, we don't want to encourage divorce, but in this case, it's already, you know, there's no, they're not going to reconcile. It's not, it's not like we need to get them in for a few counseling sessions. So they're, they're split. So then if they're split, they're split and you should get divorced. <coughs> So um, if the husband refuses, they, they try to pressure the husband. If he still refuses, they can put him <laughs> in jail in the contempt of court. And there have been a handful of cases where they did that. And there's one husband that went to jail and he said, I still won't give my wife a divorce. Because, you know, she really can't have sex with anyone else. She can't live with anyone else. She can't marry anyone else until he gives her a divorce. So he's so vindictive. She she may maybe she wants to remarry, have children with the new husband, let's say. Can't do any of that because she doesn't have a divorce. Now, if she's not orthodox, she can say, well, to hell with you. I'm going to go to Cyprus. You know, I have a civil divorce. I'll get a civil divorce there. I'll get a new marriage there and I'll have kids with new husband and but that but the kids then would be technically moms are in. So if they grow up in Israel, the rabbinic court can say nobody can marry them, which may not bother them. They can go to Cyprus and get married there just like their mother did. But if you want to be orthodox and you want to be accepted into the still accepted in the community in which you've lived your whole life, you can't do that. So there's so so there are there there have been a couple of men that have spent years in prison refusing to so so um so so the rabbis in Israel have tried a little bit to, to put pressure, but the system is obviously not good. There should there should be a, a way that if the husband refuses, the, the rabbinic judges can simply say, We're ordering the um the, the get to be delivered on behalf of the husband, even though he doesn't agree, we're doing it for him and it's considered a valid divorce. So there's they no such thing as an orthodox hitman? Uh, well, you could do that because if the husband refuses to divorce the wife and the wife can't get remarried, obviously a solution would be if the husband were to die, then you don't need a divorce. So <laughs> it sounds like a good movie. So uh, Joseph dies suddenly from a supposed heart attack, but everybody knows that he's been refusing to give his wife a divorce. She's living with a new boyfriend, and but she doesn't want to marry him because she's afraid of her parents' response. And then the husband suddenly drops dead of supposedly a heart attack. But he'd done heart tests three weeks before, which found that his heart was as solid as a uh, marathon runner's. And the doctors are puzzled. But his new girlfriend says it was the wife. Marsha. And, and she could, he could be holding... She could bring money into the marriage, and now once they're married and he refuses to give her a divorce, he can hold her uh, finances hostage, basically. Yes. Yes, because, well, you know, maybe they mingled their resources and right. she wants to extricate at least what she can from the resources. Right. If he won't get a, do a divorce, he could potentially, they could force... A situation where they're freezing the money for both parties until they can settle the thing because they don't want either party to to loot the common assets until they're divided up so um yeah i could see there being motives for murder here pam <laughs> i just saw so, the water about that uh, <laughs> she knocked him off Rob, i'm just curious as to is there any information available as to the social and economic status 
of the people at that time, the Jewish people at that time. And if so, I'm curious as to how much of a part that played in in the uh, uh, in the use uh, of the rules and regulations that existed. Um, ask your question again, Sai. Like any like any society, I'm asking as to whether there was a big economic and social differences amongst the people. You know, there were there a lot of <laughs> poor people, uneducated people, and so forth. So against those who had a lot of money, who wielded a lot of power, and if so, I wonder, you know, how much of uh, of uh, that power was used in the courts. You know, if you were rich and socially acceptable, it didn't make a difference in what you did with some stranger vis-a-vis -vis your wife. Um, there's no question there was a huge economic difference. A uh, second temple period, and the, at the time you see the prophets, you know, complaining, uh, 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 yelling against the rich people, who they said you're you're very wealthy and you do nothing to help the poor. There's so many very very poor people here. They have no hope, and you're doing you sit in your mansions and eat your fancy food. Um, you know, off of your China, and you do nothing. Um, there was no question that the very rich had most of the influence on these courts. Uh, absolutely, there was. And during the, 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 the great revolt against Rome, the Jews were fighting among themselves, and a lot of that had to do with, with you know, with uh, different uh, uh, socioeconomic groups that were very resentful to, to each other. And you can see that echoed in the New Testament. Jesus is a Jewish is a Jewish religious leader running his own little group. And one of the one of the premises of their group is we're poor and the rich are not being fair. And you know we're we're hoping that our leader is a rabbi who can address this problem. So he's an early Fidel Castro of sorts. Thank you for smiling. Okay, Pam, back to you. More? I am uh, passing the baton. Okay. Who'd like to read? Where are we? I lost my place. Uh, we are so many conditions. Min minions. It's, it's going to read. Okay. So many conditions. Bottom of page 19 on the left. Okay. So many conditions. For example, the warning about a specific man, the presence of two witnesses to testify to the time spent secretly with that specific man, the husband's record of fidelity, the necessity to hear the case before the Supreme Court in Jerusalem, were spelled out that women were protected from the fury of jealous husbands who might treat them unjustly. Even a woman under suspicion could not legally be thrown out of her home, divorced or physically harmed. Rabbinic law assured her right to a fair inquiry and trial. Protecting women. You want me to do the box? No. Uh, the box just gives Sefer Chinook, which is 13th century Spain, just summarizes what we've said already. Okay. By the time the temple is destroyed and the Supreme Court, or Sanhedrin, ceases to function in 70 CE, the use of the ordeal of the water of bitterness for the Sota is no longer practiced. For many commentators, however, other questions about the treatment of the suspected adulteress remain, why would a wife, or for that matter, a husband, become unfaithful? How should jealousy, envy, anger, and abuse be handled by courts of law? What is so unique about the relationship of a husband and wife that the matter of suspected adultery requires not only an elaborate ceremony of proof, but also attention from a Supreme Court in Jerusalem? In exploring these questions, the rabbinic commentators speculate on what might cause a wife 
to seek a sexual relationship with a man other than her husband. Quoting the wisdom of Proverbs, a person who commits adultery is devoid of sense. Only a self-destructive person does such a thing. The rabbis draw a parallel between insanity and infidelity. In another discussion, they boldly declare that every moral lapse is also a mental one. In other words, no person sins without losing a grasp on reality. Harmful decisions are made by those who fail to understand the consequences of their actions. Okay, thank you. So they're saying a lot of times when this happens is because people are immature or even uh, lacking in um, what we would call today emotional intelligence, that they fail to understand the, the uh, terrible negative consequences of their act. Of course, today there's far less terrible negative consequence for the act. People do this all the time and move on and they don't seem to be terribly bothered by it. So, but in those societies that we're talking about in the ancient, you know, in the second temple period, there was terrible negative consequences for sure. And one of the reasons that you want, you know, you might want terrible negative consequences is to discourage this sort of behavior. If there, if there's no consequences or almost no consequences, people do this all the time with no fault divorce. You can have an affair, get a divorce, move on to the next husband or wife, and it doesn't really matter. In fact, you might profit from it. So, you know, but in those times, it was certainly negative. Uh, comments? Well, Reva. Yeah, uh, one thing that stands out for me is there's no nuanced um, consideration of why people might have a relationship outside of their marriage. One common one nowadays is one of the partners has dementia and mm -hmm. is totally incapacitated um, and and living in a nursing home or whatever. And the, the other uh, spouse makes a decision to have a relationship with another person or not. It's that kind of consideration where I think a lot of society is much more tolerant nowadays of once a once a one of the partners is completely incapacitated, not mentally present at all, right. that um, there, there might be other options and it might right. be more socially and ethically acceptable. Right. So I'm not sure that they don't. Sir Harvey Fields is assuming here a younger couple where both are perfectly healthy. And, you know, these things do happen. When I was in Albany, Georgia, they had a um, marine base there. And I remember I was, uh, we had a part-time employee whose husband was uh, on the marine base and several of our congregants were as well. And there were three or four cases where um, um, not, not only on that base, but in other bases where people were coming back from Iraq and then one of the spouses within a week or two is ending up dead. And so, you know, you know, the, the spouse goes away and the other spouse starts a new relationship. And the other the first spouse is in the war zone thinking uh, the thing keeping me alive is the love of my wife comes back. Find the wife greets him at the airport and says, I've got a new boyfriend. I want a divorce. He can't deal with it. And a few days later, he shoots the wife and maybe the boyfriend. It happened a lot. So that's the cases that Harvey Fields is thinking about. That's obviously quite different that your spouse is in a, in a, a memory ward, doesn't know who you are. Uh, you know, that's very different. You would think that the rabbis would be able to then, you know, make some sort of accommodation. I guess uh, in terms of halakha they would have to say that you you might they might allow a divorce but the spouse probably doesn't want a divorce they just you know it, it, you know life is complicated you know and uh um but but yeah i mean at least in but remember harvey fields is writing here for 12 year olds <laughs> sure <laughs> they're not so concerned about the bubby and zadie 
they they think all people over 30 are of dementia yeah so they don't differentiate between uh old people are old uh other comments nan have, b have, uh marcia and then maybe b, b or lorraine wants to say something yes marcia if um did you ever have a uh bar mitzvah kid have to a mitzvah kid have to do this Marcia? as a well, sure, there's other things in this Parsha to talk about than that. Uh, there's the Nazarite. You could talk about the Nazarite. There's, there's, um, you know, there's other... Uh, there's other choices, but I wondered if they might have, if you ever had anybody handle this one. Um, not to my knowledge. There's... Um, <laughs> there's a race in God's name, there's con confession, there's uh, restitution, there's um, Gershom, there's there's lots of things you could talk about here. Um, there's the Israelite camp, there's dishonesty, um, you know, but the Nazarite would be the logical thing. There's the priestly blessing, right? The uh, may God bless you and guard you. May God cause uh, the divine sh sh uh, face to shine upon you and favor you. May God raise the divine face toward you and grant you peace. That's in this part. Nice yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's so the, so there's lots of stuff, but um, um, but no. I mean, most of my congregations we had like six, six, eight bar mitzvahs a year. It wasn't that quantity, like in, you know, in some of these synagogues where they've got two bar mitzvahs every week. So, um, so there, but, but, but I wouldn't really encourage it, but if the kid came and said he wanted to do it, that would be okay. You know, where there's plenty to say, but it's kind of an adult theme. Right. And it's kind of difficult. It's a difficult thing to, to sermonize on because, you know, you don't, you know, you don't want a sermon that just says the Torah is old fashioned and, and irrelevant, but you also don't want a bar mitzvah confirming that the rules of the Torah are appropriate for today. So I'm not sure how I would see this working for a bar mitzvah. Um, um, B, Lorraine, Donna, Shirley, um, Steve, Evelyn, Bernie. Okay, nobody. Okay, um, let's uh, um, uh, turn to page 20, uh, Pinchas Peli. He's still, I looked him up yesterday. He's still alive. He's like 89. Uh, he's Israeli originally, but he was a professor at University of Central Florida for a long time. While modern, I'm on the right column on page 20 toward the bottom. While modern commentary Pinchas Peli does not disagree with Rabbi Meir's psychological observations or with the cause of stress between husband and wife, he does offer a different view about the strange ceremony of the water of bitterness, which I sell, so don't forget that. <laughs> he speculates that it is possible that Torah devised the best way under the circumstances to save this marriage by removing the mutual psychological distrust between husband and wife. That is to say that the Sota ceremony is an extreme remedial measure for a troubled marriage. Jealousy over possessiveness and similar mo emotions can be destructive and explosive in any husband-wife relationship. The Sota ritual brings to us one painful remedy. So I guess Pelly is suggesting that the you know that if there's a real lot of antagonism, perhaps this ceremony could be a non-lethal way to let out the negative emotions, and perhaps the husband and wife could start again with you know, get out their negativity, you know, get out the accusations cry and yell, maybe throw a rotten tomato at the other person, and then 
resolve to kind of start again under a better footing. Okay, a couple of quick final comments, and if not, then we're, we'll, we'll close it up with the final prayer. Um, next week, we've got the responding to murmuring and complaints. I'm, I, I made sure I'd still be here because as a pulpit rabbi, I am the world's expert in responding to both murmuring and complaining. So I know all about that. Um, any other final thoughts? If not, over to you, Steve. Donna, you have your hand up. Go ahead and unmute. You have to unmute. Okay. Um, I want to explain something. I'm not always able to come on Friday nights. I am being worked up to, to, um, to possibility of a hip replacement or some injections, and I have not always been able to get there. I may not always, if they do a hip replacement, I may not always be able to come on Zoom for the Torah study. And uh, I will see the physician, the surgeon tomorrow, and we will see. But if I'm not here, it's I'm here in my heart <laughs> because I really do love this this teaching. So anyway, I will keep you informed uh, as it goes along, and uh, I would appreciate any of your prayers. One of the things that God gives us is our prayer for, for not only for ourselves, but for other people as well. So thank you all. Well, keep in mind, keep in mind that you can always uh, watch us on on uh, uh, recording. So you know it's on YouTube. So keep that in mind as well. I will. Thank you. And John, uh, what is your Hebrew name? Uh, my Hebrew name that God gave me before was uh, was Ruth. Oh. Ruth. Yes. Okay. It was my favorite name, uh, even though it is a wonderful name. But uh, that's what he, the Lord gave me. Oh. Okay. okay. And any word on Babette? How she made out? Or what happened to her? Oh, she had spine uh, surgery yesterday. She had what? Spine oh, surgery. Spine surgery. Wow. Okay. We'll keep her in our prayers for sure. Please. Okay. A um, couple announcements before we do the blessing. Um, don't forget the can-do item is toothpaste and toothbrushes. And all this goes to the Valley View food bank. Uh, they are, would appreciate that. Uh, and I believe Friday night is Shavuot and the installation of uh, the newly elected officers. So hopefully you can join us for that. Now, let's, anything else, Rabbi, that you have to say? No. Uh, no, it's, uh, it'll be a good service this Friday. Maybe a little long, but good. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's the, let's go ahead and uh, do the final blessing then. Together, Baruch, Atah, and the light. Yilam, Melech, Olam, Asher, Atamanu, Barat, Emet, Bechai, Olam, Notah, Betokai. Baruch, Atah, and the light. Notain, Atah, Blessed is Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, who has given us a teaching of truth, truth. In planning the eternal life. Blessed is Blessed the Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen. All right, everyone, have a great rest of the week, and uh, we'll see you soon. Okay. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye, all.